Hello and welcome to Software Engineering Daily. My name is Joe Nash and I'm your host for today. And I'm joined today by Emilio Coppola, the Executive Director at the Godot Foundation. Emilio, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me here. Well, very excited to talk about Godot. You know, funnily enough, uh, and I mentioned this before the show, my path to this podcast came through Godot. So I've been looking forward to this conversation. Um, before we get into, you know, your background and how you came to be where you are, I think we kind of have to set some context for listeners who aren't familiar. Can you tell me briefly what is Godot? So Godot is a, an open source game engine to make video games or apps. And it's everything that you need for it, right? Like it's mm -hmm. the editor, but also the engine that it runs and everything in it. A, a, there has a programming language. It has the entire package for you to build uh, and a game or an application. Perfect. So getting into you know you and your background, as I said, you're currently the executive director of the Godot Foundation. How did you get here? What was your journey with Godot? So I started actually making videos on YouTube, tutorials mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, I really wanted to cover, like when I started, there, it wasn't so popular, so there wasn't a lot of resources. And I wanted to teach people how to use it because I came from using other proprietary software and I found like, yeah, that they had so much better like learning material and all that. And I prefer to watch videos. So I said, okay, it's my time to do uh, the community a service and started with that. But after making videos and all that, I also got more involved into the production of the engine itself. So I started joining the different communities where the developers hang out and yeah, one thing, one thing led to <laughs> another and I ended up like uh, working a lot. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, you know, some of the things you mentioned there, you know, you mentioned working on other proprietary engines and you work, you mentioned being able to get involved with the communities. Of course, one of the things about Godot is it is open source. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that works for the engine? Yeah, yeah. So generally speaking, I was surprised uh, actually to find out like how closed source the, the game engine world is in general. Like the, the gaming industry is not so used to dealing with open source projects. So I think this is like, it's not the only one, but it's a very, very popular uh, option. But yeah, the, the cool thing about open source and game engines is that you actually own all the code that is in your game. So you don't have to be licensing the engine to other companies to, to send it, to ship it, to modify it, to do anything you want. And that, that's an extra layer of flexibility that not a lot of other engines give you. Uh, before being in games, I was in web development, and this right. is like the standards in everything web related, like you don't even notice, but everything is open source. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is aimed to be, you know, like, I guess the first mainstream open source project in the in the game developer world yeah, for sure. most people that are studying making games and, and things like that. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, especially, you know, the comparison to web dev. I think and this is jumping forward to some topics we'll cover in a bit. But, you know, with the recent discourse, I think one of the messages that I saw quite frequently said was like, oh, this is, you know, gaming's moment to catch up with web development and like, you know, how open source has kind of redefined other tech related industries. And so I think it's a fantastic point. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, you mentioned other engines. Um, if you were speaking to someone who is new to game development and, you know, is still looking at building out their first game and has all this landscape in front of them, all these different options. What would you say, aside from being open source, of course, sets Godot apart from those engines? Well, it's very easy to use. And I think that's, you know, like the biggest thing, at least for me and for many other people I know that even if open source usually has this reputation of not being very approachable, right? It's mostly built for like from software developers to other software developers, but Godot Engine is, is very easy to use. Like the editor itself has everything you need. And as I said before, like it contains the whole package. You don't need to go to add any extra libraries or things like that, because there are like open source frameworks that you can use right. to make games, but you need to use other programs to make the levels or things like that. So I think that Godot is very approachable. It's very easy to, to pick up and start playing around with it. And it also has its own uh, programming language, which it's only used in Godot. It's very similar to Python. And I actually recently noticed that nobody complains about it being hard. Yeah. People have, of course, complaints, but nobody complains about it being hard. Like you can actually start working on it. If you already do any sort of programming in other language, you almost don't notice in a week you're already up to speed. And I think it's, yeah, like that's the biggest advantage of Godot, like how quickly you can get things done and it's very easy to learn. 
yeah, I mean, as someone who's come to Godot this year, like I would totally, totally agree with that. Especially the GD script thing is interesting, and I think it's worth spending some time on it now. And I know this has been a constant topic for everyone in the project yeah. for the last couple of months. Um, but you know, why does why does Godot have its own language? Well, at the beginning, it wasn't the case. Like yeah. uh, I believe the first thing that was implemented was Lua for yeah. scripting and things like that. But after some time, like what happens with general purpose languages is that they are meant to be that general purpose to do many other things. And the advantages of having something like GDScript is that the language is completely built into all the functionalities you need to build games. Like if you compare it with Python, which is the one that has the similar like uh, syntax yeah. and you know, the like ethos, you see that it's actually faster to write GDScript because you don't have to do a lot of the stuff that Python requires from you. I remember making games in Pygame before, and you know you have these classes that you start to need to specify self in front of every variable that you're referencing, sure. and a lot of things like that that you don't really need to do in GDScript. And the integration with the editor and everything also make it very easy to also extend the editor. So I think it's very nice to control that and to make it really focus on making games like not on anything else it's not for making web servers it's not for making I mean, if you could do those things right? but <laughs> yeah. it's for making games yeah and, absolutely and I'm, really... I'm sure someone out there has deployed uh godot in headless mode to act as a web server that's definitely exists <laughs> <laughs> For sure, yeah. Um, so you mentioned a couple of things there that i want to jump on because i think they're really interesting so um the integration with the editor again I know there has been discourse here. So one of the things, one of the, I guess, the misconceptions I've seen swirling about this year is like, because there is such tight integration with the editor, because the editor has everything built in, it's that, you know, you need to fundamentally use Godot in mouse and keyboard mode. Like you can't just go, you know, you can't start from code. You can't start developing your game in a text only mindset. My understanding, and I haven't tried this myself yet, is that that's not the case. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, you can you can use it as a framework if you want to, and it has been used. You can use different parts of the project since it's open source. You can just take away stuff from it, and yeah, you you can do everything with code if you want to. And you know, the editor is optional mm -hmm. if you want to really go into like all the structure of what Godot does is just simplify that process for you. It's kind of like a supercharged IDE for you. Uh, but it's not required that you use it. Some people use external editors to manipulate with files. You can even extend it with other programming languages, you know, like C++. Oh. You can you can do a lot of things with it. So it's really, really flexible. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah. So you've mentioned extension a couple of times as well. So, you know, from within um, GD script um, directly in the editor, you've also now mentioned C++. Um, on the topic of C++, you know, we've spoken about GD script, but there is other supported languages, right? Yeah, yeah. At the moment, you you can make a built-in. You can have like a GD extension, mm -hmm. which is like the C plus uh, plus kind of like bridge. So you can build some part of your logic with C plus plus and use it. But you can also use GD extension to do bindings to other languages. And there are community built ones. And there's also another built-in language uh, other than GDScript, which is C sharp which is, you know, at the moment, very popular in game development world because it's the language most used for for making games like in engines like Unity. There yeah. were a lot of also XNA developers around that also wanted to use C Sharp. So those are like the, the main one, but there's a very popular community like binding for Rust, for instance, and things like that. So yeah, th there's a lot of options out there cool. that you can use. So, you know, Speaking of extensions, so there's GD extensions, and then you know there's other abilities like the ability to declare a script as a tool script, for example, which uh, is one of was one of the things that like blew my mind the most when I started getting into uh, Godot. Can you briefly explain you know the the extension functionality and what the the different options are? Yeah, so the editor itself is built in with some things that we call nodes, and nodes are elements that you can reuse in different parts of, of your games. And those nodes, the control nodes, which are creating the UI, are the same ones that we use for also like making the editor. So in the same way you're building the UI in your game, you can build tools for the editor itself. Uh, that you can use to extend it. So you can create functionalities for other members of your team that might need to modify something. And you know you want to make it easier, for instance, to import some things in the editor or things like that. You can write all that logic and extend the editor with it. 
So the cool thing about having those two together is that you don't really need to learn how to extend the editor. If you're already making games with Godot, you already know how to modify the editor itself. And yeah, my, my goal in the future would be to make it as good as possible for you to even contribute to the engine with GT script only because it's very easy to use, but, but yeah, maybe it's a bit uh, <laughs> going on a tangent there. But yeah, like uh, you can extend any part of the editor with simple code. And if you don't want a button somewhere, you want to move it somewhere else, you can do it. You can modify all of it. And it's not that you need to recompile the entire thing. It's very, very easy to plug and play any of those plugins. Okay, fantastic. So you said a key thing there, which again is one of the most fascinating things about Godot, which is it is in itself is built in Godot. So I'm really interested in so much about this, like how this decision came about, how this happened. You know, we've lots of people have heard of dog fooding, like trying your product to build your product. And you know, but this is a game engine and that's a desktop application. Like how how does that work? <laughs> yeah, well, it's actually, you know, like once when you're building the tools for making these sort of things, like I don't think it makes sense to do like a different set of tools for the editor and for the games. So the biggest inspiration for the project for the UI side was Qt. Um, so the idea was to do something similar to Qt to build the tools for making the games. But after you have so perfected those tools and those you know UI elements, why not reuse them in in the rest of your projects, right? Yeah. Um, so that was a little bit more like an organic growth, right? Like from getting those sort of tools available to make the games to also providing a way for users to use those tools. And if you want to have a drop down, you don't have to code one from from scratch, right? That like I I learned how to make video games in Game Maker, and I don't know how it is at the moment, but at the moment didn't have any sort of UI tool, but the entire Game Maker editor is like a UI application. So sure. what Godot does is exposes those libraries for you to use, and it makes it really easy to 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 get you know quite good quality UI already there without you having to implement everything from scratch or having to depend on a third party library. Mm -hmm. And same as everything else, everything is under the MIT license, mm -hmm. so it's very permissive, and you can do whatever you want with it with options like Qt, which is very popular for making desktop applications. The license is a little bit more restrict, uh, re, um, restrictive. restrictive. Yeah. yeah. And um, you might need to license it if you want to do a commercial project. And you know, otherwise, you need to release on a open source license. So yeah, I think like it was more like an organic thing. I don't think it was as planned sure. uh, as other stuff, but yeah. Interesting. Okay. So, I mean, I guess one question, you know, I had about this from the start, and this is coming from, you know, I've worked on Electron apps, and so I've been deep in the desktop performance discourse, is like what what this means performance-wise. Because, you know, is it rendering the desktop applications in the same way as like a game? Like, is it, you know, pushing out a frame? Is it concerned with like frames per second throughput and this kind of thing? Or is it, is there a desktop optimized mode? Does that make sense? Yeah, there, there is a, a desktop of you know, you can refresh it in different ways. Cool. By default, everything is built for making games. So yeah. it's only going to be like that. If you're building an application, you might want to look into not refreshing the screen on every frame because you might not need to do that. But the primarily goal of the Godot engine is to make games. So like all the defaults are going to be for games. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. So, you know, going back to making games and talking about, you know, actually using Godot as a, as a game developer, and you've mentioned this already, one of the things you're going to encounter as you start using Godot for the first time is, you know, these concepts of nodes and signals, which I guess are, for lack of a better word, like Godot's primitives. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what those are and how they, you know, affect your development flow as a game developer in Godot? So Godot are like, like the building blocks of the engine. So you can do a lot of things with the nodes and they are all inheriting from different nodes. So you have like the family of the 2D nodes for everything 2D, the 3D nodes for everything that's 3D and the control nodes for everything that's UI. And you can start using them also extending them and reusing them in other projects or in the same project as well um, many times when you're starting building something you get for instance if you want a character there's already a character node that you can throw in there and modify very quickly you get already like the physics interactions with other elements and you you know things like that with the 3d as well you know you have like the different 
sort of things you might need, even like a, a car controller, like a lot of high level stuff as well. The cool thing about those is that you can create your own nodes. And once you get used to that, that you can reuse them. You can have these units like that are very, very easy to customize from the editor as well. And you don't really have to think a lot about the structure of how you're going to make your game, right? Like some engines have a very clear idea how you uh, how they want you to build the these the things sure. but in Godot you kind of kind you you can figure out a way that works better for you and your team right like you right. can have something part of the team working on some set of eng of nodes and sharing them or doing you know tools on top of them so you yeah. can use them in whatever way you want one thing that's really common is that at the beginning when you don't really know the built-in nodes you might implement something and then you realize there's already a node that does that for you <laughs> i've done that <laughs> uh, so it's <laughs> i mean it happens to everybody so it's quite nice to at least try them out and read a little bit about them because you have a lot of things already built in yeah. and that's also what's helping making games we got out faster right you don't need to reinvent the wheel many times but you can do so if you wish to yeah, absolutely. So, you, you know, that you mentioned a really interesting thing there of, you know, some engines more opinionated in how you structure things and you can kind of do it your own way. Just make sure I understand what you mean there. I guess an example of that might be, for example, like entity component system, which is like, you know, a, yeah. a way of structuring stuff that many engines use. And you can do that in Godot. You can totally use nodes to do that, but it's not opinionated about that by default. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's at least, you know, like what I feel. I have a particular way of building games, but yeah. the thing about these sort of like general purpose engines is that a lot of people have their own workflows and as we said before right you can even make a game that only has one node and that node that's everything you yeah. could do that but it's you know it's quite flexible enough so you can do entities if you want there's also like a, a branch like a like a fork of Godot to do ECS okay. if you want to actually but yeah I really like the notes I wasn't too familiar with it i wasn't really usually don't go too much into uh, object oriented stuff yeah. and uh, i think this is object oriented done the right way or at least like I, I, that, it doesn't feel really bad to use so that's you know yeah it's interesting to try i think that at the beginning it's a bit confusing because it's not something you're used to seeing but everybody i hear about like they, they like the system once you get used to it and it doesn't take too long so it's giving it a try yeah, no, I'd agree with that. There's definitely a, uh, as you start to realize how and why you should compose nodes into scenes and like, you know, you can throw scenes into scenes and like how you should, what power, yeah. what flexibility it gives you the structure stuff, it becomes contagious very quickly, for sure. Um, so one of the things you mentioned earlier was, you know, you didn't start with, GScript didn't exist at the beginning, it was like a change that came along the way. And I think another area that's similar to that that's really interesting is the evolution of uh, the physics engine. Um, so my understanding of the history here is, you know, originally you're using an engine called Bullet, which is a third party engine. Um, and then as part of Godot's, you know, philosophy of everything being the editor and being inclusive, um, for Godot 4.0, due to reasons you made your own engine and now we're kind of coming back to like the dawn of a third party engine might be coming back in which is joel can you run us through i guess like the ethos here like why you know go for your own engine why askew third party stuff and then you know the change in in ideals why are we going back to third party yeah yeah so you know of course the one thing we want to do is you know if there's already something popular that works for everybody like you use that is better than just having to make something from scratch and what we used before it worked for the Godot 3 version of it and it was you know like generally okay but there were some things that we would like to improve on it and there wasn't any flexibility for our cases uh, our use cases so the thing about this being a community driven project and an open source project is that sometimes you get people that come in and help and then you know you don't know what might happen to them they might disappear after yeah. a while or so with the physics engines when we were building Godot 4 that's something like there was a very active contributor that helped a lot into shaping that to be you know like what the Godot 4 physics are but um but he's not he's no longer contributing to the project he got like a different job and you know like this happens very yeah, often sure. and the problem with the physics in particular is that it's something that is not so common to find a physics engine programmer that can do something really well in this area right because 
it's not only that you need to do the physics that are like fun or like realistic enough, but it also needs to happen so quickly, right? Like you can do physics in a very like uh, poorly performant way and you should be fine in a lot of cases. But if you want to make it for a video game, they need to run like super quick and finding some compromises there into making it good for a game engine is really difficult. And if you know how to do that, you're probably already working on a AAA <laughs> company on a proprietary engine and something yeah. like that. And, you know, it, it's a very relatively small like budget that we have for these sort of things and we cannot offer super competitive uh, salaries so we depend a lot on those contributions and at the moment there isn't a lot of active members of the community who know or who are interested in contributing there so after a while of trying to patch and to fix what got out for physics engine was uh, there was this new physics engine that got like released uh, on MIT, which is the Jolts physics. And um, since it, it, the license is the same as with Godot, like a community member did an integration. And that's, you know, after trying it out and people using it and giving it good reviews and all that, it was a validation, like maybe this is the way to go, right? We get this physics engine who was used on a triple A game that is already battle tested and it's very performant. If we can use that instead, it will be better than what we can do ourselves. And the cool thing about it is that we only need to code the glue thing between right. Godot and this physics engine. We don't need to implement the physics uh, ourselves, which is the difficult part. So we have a lot of people that are like proficient enough, enough to make the glue, but we don't have enough people that are proficient enough to make the the physics. I also found out doing this, I'm not very good at physics, but I found out that some of those algorithms are also like a lice, like, um, oh, like patented patented? Yeah, patented. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you need to kind of re-implement some things that are doing the same, but are not yeah. the same implementation as some other people did. And it gets a little bit trickier. So this is the, the story of why we ended up now. Now we are considering in the future, I don't know if it's going to be 4.3 or 4.4, but we're going to be shipping Jolt probably as the default uh, physics engine. And you'll still have the Godot physics there just in case for legacy reasons or if you want to do it. But yeah, generally speaking, it's much better than, than ours. I think it still has a couple of features that need to be implemented in Jolt for it to be all the features that we, set, we provide, uh, yeah. but it shouldn't be much longer to get there. Fantastic. Yeah, that physics algorithm patent issue, I feel like has been really uh, prominent recently because some studio like patented a really obvious and long running like way of making people characters move with platforms or something. It's been a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, you know, all these sort of things are very tricky once you get into these licenses. And since yeah. they've been operating in proprietary engines for a very long time, there's a lot of things you cannot do. But yeah. yeah. It, it, I think we're getting there. Like people are are starting to to get out of the hole. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So you know, you mentioned future versions of Godot four point three point four point four. At the time of recording, four point two is just around the corner. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about you know what's what's new in four point two and what you're most excited about? There's way too many things, actually. Yeah, that, that's actually one of the problems. There's yeah. too much stuff to to add there. Mm. Um, I, I think. Like for 4.2 in general, like it, it was a continuation of what 4.1 was, right? Like a, just getting more, like a better experience for developing. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of features you can read on our blog post. We highlight and we show a lot of the individual features. Some might interest you more than others. But what I like is that it's getting easier also to to know sometimes like what things are going wrong, how can you make them better? Like mm -hmm. before at the beginning it was a bit, you know, things failed for no reason. That That's yeah. at least my experience. I'm mostly making tools and it greatly improved like the workflow as well. Like there's a lot of things we had to um, do a lot of code just to get access to some of the editor functionality that we can now get easier. Nice. But again, there's the list is too long. Like, honestly, like if you want to check the blog post, you have all the information with nice graphical, like animations and all that, that yeah. it makes it better because if you say, you know, 
let's say like the FSR update that you can get more frames with the same quality, like unless you see it right. in working, you don't really... Yeah. yeah, that makes total sense. We'll make sure that links in the in the uh, show notes as well. So I guess to, to jump onto that, a question I'm interested in here is, you know, you have folks who are paid in some form or another, either, you know, through grants or from the foundation or from other supporting organizations. You have community contributions and you have these huge patch, you know, these huge version bumps coming out. How do you decide as a project, as a community, what work is making it into each release like is that a practically planned thing or is it like whoever gets there's a deadline get it through the door and it comes through the door like how does that work so there's different ways but mostly like our goal from the foundation side is that the people the, the foundation hires will work on things that the community want so if we see there's a lot of interest from the community for instance in the god of four there was like a rebuild of like some of the areas of the engine, like because the community wanted better versions of it, we can dedicate those resources there. Mm -hmm. um, but some other companies have their own interests and sometimes those things don't align. So those features get left out. What we really want to get into the engine itself is what will benefit most of our users. And that depends on the, on the moment, right? Like uh, sometimes we get up to a point where we don't hear about the feature anymore, not because people don't like it, but because it's already working and sure. there isn't any big issues. But sometimes the local, uh, the, the current events influence also the community to, to request some other things. Um, yeah. Recently with all the controversy around Unity and other things like that, like a lot of people jumped to, to Godot and they are very, they, being very vocal about wanting better C-sharp support, for instance. Yeah. So in this case, like our plan, of course, like C-sharp was on our roadmap, but since there's a new batch of people coming in and a lot more interest, that also like, how can we make the experience of using C-sharp better with the engine itself? Um, but there is a, a group of people at the production team, which actually decides what things get in and what doesn't, but it's not really like the final say, it's mostly like if the feature is in line with the goals of the project, and if it makes sense for a general purpose kind of thing, like it generally gets merged, but also if it aligns with the roadmap that the team have, like if you want to add a feature that's a, a very controversial thing, is a lot of people want to have like a built-in, 3d map editor and it's a big feature that you know before merging something like that into the project we need to make sure that we can also support it like long term we need to make sure that it's good enough for people to use and if you meet all the criteria and there's people interested in maintaining it and it makes sense for a general purpose engine we merge it but it really is on case by case uh yeah. depending on each pr um there's there's too many things that come our way that might be good for one person, you know, for their workflow. And it's good to identify when those things can be a plugin or an extension for that person or studio and what can benefit everybody. But yeah, it really depends. Excellent. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. So, so you mentioned that the the recent situation with Unity and the response, um, which we've alluded to a couple of times, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But before we get to that, I want to kind of talk about the Godot Foundation at like a higher level. So, you know, lots of open source projects go through the challenge of being, you know, like a, a little scrappy operation maintained in free time to having to mature and find funding. What was that journey like for Godot? Like, what was the inception of the Godot Foundation? So before they got a foundation, the project was operating through the Software Freedom Conservancy, which is an organization, a nonprofit organization from the US, whose goal is to do just that, right? Being the legal entity for these open source projects. Because when you have an open source project at the beginning that nobody like knows about, like you don't have a lot of problems in terms of like getting donations, getting grants, getting those things that doesn't happen. But when it does happen, you suddenly need like a bank account where to receive that money, like a proper document of like ownership, like who's going to be owning the project or things like that. So all that was being done by uh, the software free and conservancy. But once the project got bigger and bigger and bigger, we got even too big for them to manage. And it was really 
nice for us to have a little bit more independence in terms of what we can do with you know the project itself um and you know there was this need of also doing other things that requires a little bit more of independence like for instance uh if we wanted to do an asset store which is something that people really want like it didn't fit the model that the software free and conservancy had in mind so we ended up going with our own organization and uh, it's been quite challenging because not everybody wants to you know like a bank yeah. doesn't care about your open source project so why would they want to open a bank account for your foundation that actually has you know like two days uh, since it's been open so it was a lot of paperwork to go through and all that but also we wanted to make sure that everything was done properly so that we can continue with the with the the operations and the needs of the project but the goal is only to support this like we are now like uh, making a few changes internally also for how we operate in terms of like we're considering making more people uh, be part of the process of like taking decisions for the foundation and things like sure. that but um but yeah the goal is just to make the growth engine better so everything we do is to structure that getting the donations from the companies or individuals and hiring people to work on the engine on the features that people want and other than that the foundation doesn't aim to do much more than this right. uh, i know that other foundations in open source groups have also you know like education programs and many other things but ours is very small yeah. <laughs> it's very tiny there are less than 10 people like working full time or part time and uh, our goal is just to make the the engine better so that's I don't know if I went a little bit more. No, no, that's, that's yeah. absolutely perfect. In fact, you you kind of led into my next question, which was going to be, you know, with that slice of things that you take care of, the funding, possible asset store, hiring people, etc. What, you know, you mentioned some things that are explicitly things you don't touch. Like, are there other um, responsibilities or tasks that you look to other organizations in the ecosystem to support? Like, what kind of things do you say, oh, we don't do that, but there's this great company we work with over here who look after that? um at the moment like we've been looking a lot at other organizations to get inspiration from how they are doing things because it's really difficult to to find what's you know like a good way of operating in this space like everybody like knows how the private sector works it's kind of sure. easy when you have a product to sell and you know investors or things that they the, the path is really obvious but here we look after other organizations that we admire like for instance blender yeah. how they do things and try to get for instance uh our funding like a platform like it was basically like a, a fork of what they had uh like you know if you look at the designs it's very very similar and you yeah. know um and also we we internally use as much open source as possible like our stack in general everything that we use to work uh, on a daily basis is open source and uh, we of course try to give back to to those projects as well but um but yeah it's a bit tricky because each organization has their own history and their own uh, like uh, goals right yeah. and even if we do like to 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 go through like what blender does in terms of like all this right like the funding and, and how they they communicate and all that it's a different organization with a different set of users with a different goal and sometimes we need to improvise a little but um but yeah okay uh, so you mentioned blender and so this is a question i've been wondering about that might be far too in the weeds but i'm gonna go for it <laughs> so you mentioned you know paperwork and issues and starting up which I imagine, you know, really varies country by country. Both Godot Foundation and Blender are registered here in the Netherlands. Is there like something in particular about the Netherlands sticking, which is good for open source foundations, or is that a coincidence? Uh, it was honestly a coincidence. Okay. Uh, the the board member who was able to do all these things was uh, is Dutch and mm -hmm. was living in the Netherlands and offered to do this kind of work. But I also believe it's easier to do some sort of thing especially if you have an online organization 
like I know from experience right now I'm living in Spain and in Spain there's a lot of things that for a foundation like this it would be really hard to do when when you have a, an online sort of organization sure. like the paperwork and things like that you have to go to a very a lot of offices all the time and there's not a lot of things you can do online uh, so I think it was a little bit of of those, but there isn't any particular reason why okay. I can tell you like it is better or not. But yeah, no, thank you for scratching that itch for me. That's been really bothering me. Um, okay, there's also the the Krita guys who are also based oh, really? in, in the Netherlands. That's yes. fascinating. Okay, excellent. Um, <laughs> I've got lots of new podcast guests to chase. <laughs> so uh, yeah. talking, going back to Unity. So you know, you mentioned all the feedback. Um, that you'd received and lots of comments and one of the things that like immediately struck me about uh, the organize like the the core Godot team in your response was like how level-headed you all being how like the level of humility the level of like focus on your existing vision and not bowing to the temptation to like drop everything to jump on this moment um, and so I have like a, a load of questions about that which is like firstly how how was that culture like how does that culture made like how do you create a team that's like able to say we're getting like the most press <laughs> we will probably get for a long time but we're going to stay we know what we're doing and we're staying focused on that like how how did that happen well i think it was like internally something that was in the making for a long time like it's not the first time that a big company screws up and we get a lot of attention so we kind of been here before yeah. it wasn't as big as this one sure. but yeah and there's also a lot of people you know like we most of us came from making our own games or making it, uh, games in companies and we know people who work in all the other companies like we have colleagues ex-colleagues and friends right like it, it's kind of like the game dev community is not as big as one might think even if it's like a huge industry yeah so uh whenever you see something that's going wrong for game developers like the first thing that we think is like this sucks and then we think like, okay, it might be an opportunity for us, but like the general feeling is like it's not a good thing yeah. to, to happen in the industry. Same with like the layoffs that are happening on AAA companies right now and, and yeah. all this. So our goal is not to, you know, to to replace what's what was there. Our goal was always to make God better. And it's it's a bit unfortunate sometimes that people jump to other things because they are being like kicked Force. off of yeah. what they were using right um so yeah i think like with with our with our work in open source and all this like we understand also the challenges of building all this and we know it's difficult and we know that there's a lot of talented people working on those companies that will never want to to live through all this but yeah. are in that situation so it's it's a bit tricky because yeah the moment we want to let's say promote it or if let's say like if you do a marketing campaign during that time which it was kind of a by coincidence we launched our funding platform at the same time so it was really good in terms of getting yeah. those donations but uh you're also setting the expectations for people that this will be the replacement of unity and then they will want that to change and that will compromise on the vision of what Corot is and what wants to be Sure. And uh, I think it's a bit, a bit, yeah, a bit complicated. And there isn't a real incentive for us to get all those users, right? Like, right. the more the merrier, the more people that contribute, it's going to be better for everybody. But we're not going to be making more money. Like, we're not right. selling licenses. So there isn't a, an intrinsic value in us getting people to use Godot other than having more people like reporting bugs or fixing bugs or you know using it um yeah so yeah i think the culture in general inside is is this right like we're making our own thing and we want to make this the best it can be and we don't need to cannibalize any other project for it we we want to make Godot what's best for Godot itself we don't want to make a better unity or anything like that sure and uh, it was something that came from before. Like I, I remember when I was younger, I was more into this kind of wars, right? Like which console war, like uh, or things like that. Love tribalism in some form or another, right? Yeah, exactly. But then you know, I think when you grow older and you understand that everybody is trying to do their best, like where they are working, like. Um, yeah, honestly, like for us, it was really like sad to see the state yeah. of it, and. 
it wasn't like something that made us happy like hey yeah we're gonna get because we also understand that we're gonna get now a lot of you know like the stakes are higher now for and sure. for a small team it's sometimes difficult to to be there yeah. in that situation and that's actually that leads me into a a, a, a I guess a, an observation that I thought was really interesting, which was, you know, ties back to, I guess, the lack of big open source usage in, in game development, which was, you know, I think my perception was that a lot of the Unity users who were coming to Godot and fielding requests or giving feedback didn't necessarily understand what their relationship with the organization could be, that they weren't just a consumer who was like, here's my money, give me my product, and that they were, in fact, like able to engage and, you know, to put things forward in a different way and to, you know, that it's, you know, there's not one person making the decisions that trickle down. How did you, I guess, to what extent do you, do you think that is true? And then secondly, like, if it is true, like, to what, how have you approached educating those people who have a very different relationship with an org about how they can greater get involved with Godot. Well, it's honestly really, really hard because yeah, like we, we get people now sending us messages as if they were not able to have a voice. And that's something that, you know, it's tricky to, to actually educate them and tell them, you know, you can participate of the discussions. Like most of the meetings we do about these particular things are open for everybody to join. And it is difficult, like there's certainly like also like a lot of high profile people that jump in and they have a very big audience. And uh, that's also a bit tricky sometimes in terms of them having one issue with the engine and not really voicing it in a very positive or constructive right. way. So a lot of people getting that idea and running with it instead of, you know, they could have come to <laughs> sure. any of our open platforms like the chat or anywhere uh, to just talk with any of us. And sometimes it's not that the engine cannot do something or that it does it wrong, it's that they are not used to the ways of doing it right. the good old way. And once they understand it, everything's fine. But you know, once they already complained publicly and everybody like went through all that uh, two weeks of tweeting, um, <laughs> Things are already yeah. kind of shaky. C sharp performance comes to mind here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, it, it's also like it, it's also I think like a change that needs to happen like over time. I don't yeah. think that it's gonna be like something that we can we can speed up too much. But yeah. I'm trying to to mitigate those sort of issues. Like at the moment, I'm trying to to get with some other team members like. Uh, uh, a discourse forum that we cool. can use to do more uh, development there because a lot of the things we used to do and we do now are on a chat that's, you know, it's kind of like similar to Slack or Discord, it's a rocket chat. Yeah. Um, and uh, many of those conversations get kind of lost in, uh, you know, in, uh, if you're not active there, you might have lost them, but having them on a public forum will help maybe get more people involved in the process. But it requires also time for us to adapt because for a long time, there wasn't too many people involved, sure. right? And uh, the things that worked before um, might not work now. Before it was very easy to to get the people involved to say, you know, like, yeah, let's improve the documentation, let's jump in and, you know, update this, update that. But the moment we cannot see what everyone is doing with it. Sure. <laughs> so we need to find better ways of capturing that interest and redirecting it to the proper place but that's something that we need to try and see what works yeah absolutely yeah i think the uh, the synchronous to asynchronous like modal yeah. shift is important as you start to especially time zone expand but yeah absolutely um yeah there, there's a lot of things happening on github yeah. which is very open but sometimes you will find there's a pr from someone and then nothing, no conversation, suddenly someone right. approves it and then <laughs> it gets merged. And it's kind of, if you don't really know who yeah. these people were, you don't know that maybe there was that day a meeting for reviewing like all the PRs for GD script and to discuss like which one, and then, you know, that gets lost. So having a better way for people to access in those sort of conversations, I think it will improve also the culture of actually yeah. how you can get involved. So. 
Great. Yeah. I mean, top tip for anyone looking here is adjusting to remote work as well. I think that's like, that's excellent. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've spoken about the funding, you've launched a new funding platform, but also, you know, again, cause the unity issue, you know, there's lots of, there's been some unprecedented things. Like the first day I saw one of the game studios say like, Hey, we're putting the money we put towards unity license towards donating to these projects we use. That was like, again, going back to the comparison to web dev, that's like not a thing that happens in web dev open source funding. That was, that was no. awesome. Um, <laughs> So I'm really interested, yeah. like, what does the the heightened support and particularly the funding mean for Godot as a project? You know, we've spoken about scaling contribution, that kind of thing, but like, does it, has it changed your capabilities and what you can build out and how much you can build out, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's helping, like, we were a little bit in the red before, like, we were spending more money than we were getting, but we had some sort of, like, reserves for, for getting along, but uh, we were kind of running out out of funds and you know it really sucks when you have to start like thinking in which ways you can fi raise funds and you know there there isn't too many options uh but thanks to this we were able to secure that like we're not in the red anymore and we might be able to onboard maybe two or three more people and uh, that will you know at the moment it's not sure like who are the ones that are going to be uh, higher so i don't want to go too much into specifics yeah. but uh yeah we want to also improve like the infrastructure sort of work that we have um because a lot of things when they rely on the volunteers are you know running well we have a lot of issues for instance on the websites not the main one but all of them like the q a platform like the documentation like all those kind of websites that we kind of have um that we need to operate our own internal platforms like the chat and all that um they were having a lot of issues and they were going down constantly and you know we were under attacks and a lot of things so improving those things i think it will make it easier and up until now there wasn't a lot of need of doing those sort of hires most of the people that got hired before to work on the engine was to work on code specifically to improve yeah. the engine but now we need a little bit more of that infrastructure way, like work, not only on websites, but also internally in terms of like, you know, we, we hired uh, Yuri recently to work on the production work who also sped up the releases that we do. Cool. And a lot of those things that are making like the machine run smoothly uh, without adding more people that codes, because uh, I think we, like we have a lot of them, but it's also hard sometimes to even to go through all the, the pull requests and all that. So yeah, I think it will help in those areas, but yeah, it, it's it's a bit uh, complicated to find people because up until now we hired mostly, not mostly, but all of them like from the community. Yeah. And the community is very technical and in open source, there isn't a lot of designers sure. uh, or UX designers or communicators or things like that. It's, it's a bit harder to get those. So we need to start looking out and it's a bit challenging. Like I've yeah. been looking for, for a community manager and things like that because like we really need one and it's, it's getting harder, right? Like you need to start reaching out, out and you also want to make sure that they understand the philosophy behind open source and yeah. you know what it means to, to be in a break like this. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of challenges, but thankfully like the, the funding was like, the first thing that will help us alleviate a lot of the workload we have in all these areas so we can focus on making the rest easier. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so as we kind of round up close to time here, there's a couple more questions I want to squeeze in. So first of all, what are your top tips for people looking to get started contributing to Godot itself? I think joining the platforms and just being a fly on the wall, it's very good. Yeah. That's at least how I started. Like I, I really didn't like the website. I went in and I was like, who's doing that? Who's working on that? I noticed that there was a lot of activity. Yeah. And then when you start knowing the people, like if you attend to any of our events, like the Eurocon or like a local meeting or in any gaming conference, we usually hang out there, like just come and chat and, you know, just sharing what you do is also a good way of helping. Like if you are doing documentation that also like not only like helps other people, but gets you more familiar with those areas. Yeah. And then you might also see in which ways you can help. Uh, but yeah, I think like just joining and being around the development area and seeing, 
in which things you think you might like to work on and try them i think it's really good there's a lot of issues that are marked as like beginner friendly or like cool. boost first issues that you can check on github if you want to contribute via code but also if you want to help in other areas as i said before like there's a lot of area. there's you yeah. know every time we publish an article on the blog post we first make a PR, everything, all this is happening on GitHub. So we get people sometimes helping us with our poor English, like <laughs> the people who are writing the, the articles are not natives most of the time. So we need someone that's actually like goes in and fix those. And, you know, those are things that you can make and, and everything is public for you to, to, to get feedback or help. So, yeah. Fantastic. And, you know, at the beginning, you mentioned, you know, yourself coming in via being a content creator. And, you know, there's, I, I think with the, the Unity issue, there's been a bunch of new content creators on the scene. Are there any kind of content creators who are active now or have been in the past who you are particularly fond of or you'd recommend as a great starting place for people wanting to learn about Godot? For learning about Godot, I think like the best tutorials I've seen were by GD Quest. I think like they have a lot of material. So I would start by that. But it depends a lot on which kind of things you want to make. I think that if you want to like to make something, for instance, that's a bit more advanced, you might want to find somewhere else, like for something in particular. But what I like of the new people that came, like the new yeah. content creators, is like you can see they have a lot of experience and usually like uh the people we have are very technical but not so artistically gifted so we get new like people like uh passive star on like, twitter has been sharing so many cool like uh, demos and things like that and then we have a, a lot of like uh, content creators that are doing this uh trying to make a game in in Gorod. so you can see their experiences and they share what they made there were like a couple big jams recently and a lot of people were posting in their YouTube channels, they were maybe like a Unity or Game Maker or like other content creators and they made their own games in Garot. They ported the ones that they have. And there's this big one now called uh, Road to Vostok, who's uh, making uh, a game, a first person shooter that was made in Unity and now is doing very nice blogs about the, how the transition is going. So I'm really happy that this the scene is not what it used to be before. And depending on what you want, like you will find something. But yeah. Yeah, those are great shouts. Passive Star also has been doing the amazing Blender like gifts of their node stuff, right? I think that they've been a lot of yeah, yeah. He's he's going through all the projects and doing the speed run <laughs> from zero to influencer. Yeah. Any percent, like they're going super fast. Like <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's a great shout out. Well, Emilio, thank you so much for joining us today. I've really enjoyed this. And uh, yeah, this is this has been awesome. Um, if people want to follow your work in particular, or, you know, keep tabs on what you're up to, where's the best place for them to go? Um, well, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, they, they, in Twitter is Emmy CPL and on Mastodon as well. Like I'm quite active in the game dev uh, Mastodon instance. And in generally, like if you follow the Godot blog, you will find what I'm working on most of the time. So yeah, like the usual places. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Same.